Uh, here today. today. At this point, I'd like to read a letter addressed address on September 9th, 2020, uh, to the Governor's Council. Council. Dear Councilors, I'm pleased to nominate the following person for the position of the Social Justice of the District Court. The nominee is Michelle Ventress of Brockton. The position of Associate Justice of the District Court, which position was authorized by Chapter 206 of the Acts of 1988, sincerely, Charles Baker, Governor. At this point, um, would the nominee like to introduce any members of her family who may be present today? Yes, thank you. Good morning, uh, Councilor Ayanella. I have with me my husband, Deshaun Fentress, and also my father, Sinclair Fleming. And I also have a witness, Sharia Boston. Okay, thank you. And my understanding uh, that you have two witnesses today, is that correct, or just one? I have two witnesses. I also have the Honorable Justice Michael Coyne, now retired, who's present via the WebEx. Okay, and um, he's available now, is that correct? That's right. Okay, so why don't we hear at this point uh, from my good friend, uh, an outstanding judge. Uh, I think he's retired now, but uh, he's a wonderful individual. I've known him for a long, long time. Let's hear from the Honorable Michael Coyne. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm sorry I'm not there in person or on video, but my technology skills are limited at my age. That's why I retired. First of all, I'd like to compliment the Baker administration and the Judicial Nominating Commission for the thorough vetting of the applicants and determining the appropriate nominees for these important positions. Now, I've had the pleasure of knowing Attorney Fentress since 2006, when she showed up at the Boston Municipal Court to begin her legal career. I've always been impressed with her polite, respectful, and well-spoken manner She's a person of keen intellect and of high moral character, and in my opinion, would be a welcome addition to the district court. Selfishly, I wish she was being appointed to the Boston Municipal Court. I was able to watch her grow and develop into an excellent attorney she is today. She possesses strong negotiation skills of a seasoned trial attorney and has earned the respect of her peers and all the court personnel she's come in contact with. She quickly rose through the ranks of the DA's office from a line DA at the BMC to the specialized position in the gun court before ascending into the ranks of the major felony division in the superior court. She's held in high regard by all the judges she's been involved with in all capacities. She's always treated everyone in the system with the respect and dignity they're entitled to. Her present position as an assistant court magistrate has given her additional insight into the day-to-day -day operations of a busy courtroom, which, as you know, requires a lot of multitasking. I believe her training and experience have given her the skills necessary to handle the position that I've enjoyed for these many years, and I strongly endorse her nomination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do any of the counselors have uh, any questions of Judge Coyne? There being no questions, we will go to the next uh, witness, Attorney Boston. Uh, we, I can't hear you. You have to put the mic closer. Testing, can you hear me now? Yep. It's good, we're good. Okay, good. Okay, so I've known Attorney Fentress for almost, um, met her almost 20 years ago, but we became close in law school at Northeastern around 2004. Michelle and I bonded over many things. Excuse me, you're a little muffled. You're, you're getting muffled. Thanks. Testing. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, Michelle and I bonded um, over many things over the years, being from the same city, having mutual friends, and being both half Jamaican and having a mutual love for Jamaican cuisine. Michelle is one year my senior and was my mentor at law school when I was 1L. 
I was blessed to have Michelle as my mentor. Despite juggling her own classes and leadership responsibilities, Michelle always made time to check in and provide sound guidance. Whether it was reviewing my resume, strategizing on how to win great co-ops, or sharing an outline, she was always there. And to date, she still looks out for me. After law school, Michelle joined the Suffolk County DA's office and I joined a law firm downtown. We'd unwind and catch up on the commuter rail ride home. She loved working at the DA's office. She quickly excelled at her work and was elevated in the agency accordingly. She loved the work, she loved the courtroom, but most importantly, she loved the diverse perspective she can bring in evaluating her cases. Being a black woman who lived in both the inner city and minority communities, as well as in the suburbs, where she had been the only minority in the room. Her experiences growing up make her uniquely suited to relate to anyone. It reflects in her diverse friend group, one of the most diverse friend groups I've ever seen. Having mastered a variety of criminal matters, Michelle sought to fulfill her curiosity in civil litigation. She gained exposure in various civil settings, including the district court, housing court, and administrative hearings. She even introduced me to an opportunity with the law firm she worked for covering me more tenant cases while I was building my own practice. I ended up covering hundreds of cases for that law firm, which allowed me to gain a breadth of knowledge and success. To date, I still pick her brain if you have any questions related to housing laws in the housing court. However, Michelle longed to be in the courtroom again, but from a different perspective. She applied to be an assistant clerk magistrate on many occasions and was not swayed by the rejection. She was patient and faithful. She received an opportunity. Three years ago, she was given um, even more than she wished for when she was offered a position as an assistant clerk magistrate in the criminal division of the Suffolk Superior Court. She is returning to the court where it all started and practicing in the criminal session that she loved. You would never know just how full Michelle's plate is as she manages it all so well with such grace. She has a high level of emotional intelligence, discipline, and poise that are all admirable. She is one person who sets goals and executes them. Michelle is the youngest on both sides of her blended family. She has always been close with her family, hosted gatherings for her family and, family and friends, and did not hesitate when her family needed her most. Throughout her life, one of Michelle's sisters struggled with severe mental health issues. From a young age, Michelle witnessed her sister battle these demons and struggle with life-altering decisions. No doubt, Michelle's ability to be so tolerant, non-judgmental, and solve problems is rooted in her upbringing and witnessing her sister's struggles, which affected the whole family. Therefore, I was not surprised when Michelle and her husband stepped up to take in her nephew. She wanted to give him a loving home, a level playing field, and a shot at succeeding in life despite the adjustments that would be necessary for her husband and children. Now, Michelle, despite her age, has unique abilities that qualify her for this position. I've always referred to her as an old soul. She's always been beyond her years intellectually and emotionally. Thus, she has thrived in her current position, especially with regard to the skills that would transfer from her current position to that of a judge. She approaches each case with an open mindset, reserving judgment until she's presented with the facts and rendering judgments based in fairness and equity to the parties. I don't know anyone who cares more about ensuring just outcomes more than Michelle. She demonstrates a great passion for fairness, self-awareness, and empathy. Michelle has great instincts and sound judgment. And she always maintains a professional composure, even in difficult and trying situations. She's well respected by her colleagues. As a practitioner, I know the need for the court to have knowledgeable and balanced individuals on the bench, and the governor's appointment of Michelle Fentress will ensure that the court continues to fill this mission. I have the utmost confidence that Michelle Fentress will serve the best interests of the court, and that she would administer fair and just decisions for the benefit of the Commonwealth and its constituents. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, uh, hearing the witnesses in support of the nominee, is there any in opposition? Can I ask a question of the Norman of the uh, witness, please? I do, certainly. I didn't see Marilyn. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, welcome. Um, I appreciate you coming in person. It's very safe here. You're about 12 feet away from me, <laughs> and you're six feet away from the nominee. And yes. I, I, it means a lot that I can see your face and see you smiling. Um, so tell me, um, how uh, the relationship, the working relationship, was it a day to day, or how? how tell me about that. I mean, Michelle and I actually never worked together, um, but um, we've always been very close uh, in touch. I feel like I've worked with her um, because she would share her experiences um, at her various jobs. Um, 
although we didn't work together in certain cases, um, when she was working at Turk and Keanu, um, I was covering cases for them. Um, so we would interact a lot. Um, and sometimes I would cover some of her cases. Um, so we would, you know, um, discuss her cases to that extent. And I've seen her work, um, you know, um, with regard to pleadings and such um, in that aspect as well. So before she was uh, um, um, an acting clerk, may I just stray? That's or? correct. Okay, so it's been how many years? Ooh. I started my practice almost 10 years ago, maybe somewhere between six and eight years ago that she worked at Turk and Keanu, I believe. So if you could tell us uh, one attribute that she is bringing to the bench, what comes to mind? <sighs> Many things come to mind um, with regard to that, but um, I think um, Michelle's um, self-awareness and empathy and social skills um, are something needed, especially in the district court, um, where you see a, a variety of cases, a variety of individuals. Um, I, she has the ability to relate to a lot of people um, due to her life experiences. And I, I feel like that's an attribute that um, is unique to her and that um, a lot of judges may not have. So you, you said empathy? Did yes. Empathy? Yeah, that's very important. Uh, to, you know, some of our judges don't have empathy, <laughs> sadly. But thank you so much for coming. Your, your testimony means a lot to me. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, that will exhaust the uh, folks who are here to speak in support. I'm sorry, Councillor Hurley, do you have a question? Yes, yes thank you. Um, so when you were saying that you were aware of the decisions she made and how she made them, um, you really were not privy to that. You didn't witness it. So how did you come to those conclusions? Well, um, well, first, um, you know, in discussions, um, of course, we would talk about some of the difficult decisions that she would have to make and, um, you know, that she would make sure that she is make sure she had the whole view before she um, would make that decision. Um, one thing I can think of in particular, I had the opportunity to witness her on um, television uh, because some of her arraignments are broadcasted depending on how big the case is. Um, and she had a very difficult case um, out of Roxbury um, where a, a gentleman um, had committed suicide and um, they were charging um, his girlfriend um, with, her, with his death. Um, and that's you know a very unique issue, um, first and foremost. Um, you know, especially with technology, um, as it's becoming more um, prevalent, especially with you know younger, um, the younger generations, um, and you're seeing um, bullying via text, etc. So it's a pretty novel issue, I believe. I mean, I think she did a great job um, at that arraignment um, in trying to make sure that the issue was weighing in the interest of both um, you know the victim's family um, as well as the defendant um, when she um, issued her judgment in that case for that arraignment. How did she issue a judgment as a person Isn't it sorry, the judge? Not, the judgment? not a judgment. I'm sorry, not, not a judgment um, in setting bail, et cetera. Isn't it the judge that sets bail? Um, the clerk magistrate does have some um, authority to set bail in certain situations. The clerk magistrate has the authority to set bail if there's a, a person who's arrested and held at the police station. Yes, you're correct. At, at the police station, um, but you know, at the arraignment and, and conducting the arraignment, I should say. All right. So she doesn't. She conducts an arraignment, but it's the judge that makes the decisions. Is that correct? It depends on the situation. Um, she does set bail in some circumstances um, before the judge hears the case. Um, she, she conducts arraignments. Um, she's not necessarily conducting trials and um, hearings on substantive issues, um, but on procedural um, issues, the clerk magistrates do have certain powers in the Superior Court. What are the powers? Um, uh, we want to set bail um, in some instances. Um, yeah. when, I know at the lower courts they bail. conduct hearings. Excuse me. When do they set bail in the courtroom? Um, in the courtroom in particular. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the um, well during certain sessions. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, I don't necessarily know the in and out of what she did 
every single day. Um, you know, in, in what instance, what's that bill? But there are. Give me one example that you're aware of where she said they Okay, I have no problem with these questions because I always let all the counselors ask any questions they want. So don't I'm not concerned about that. But if the if the witnesses doesn't know, she can just say I, I don't know. know. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I guess I would I would say that I, I've watched that particular hearing where she arranged um, the woman that was being charged um, with the death of her. Um, with her boyfriend um, that committed suicide, but I know that she has shared experiences of setting bail, um, and I, I don't know of a particular case in which setting, um, but I know that is um, one thing that, um, you know, she really had to get a grapple on on, on assessing what um, would be just bail in certain in very difficult situations, um, whether someone is released on their own recognizance, um, and things like and making those very um, tough decisions and being in superior court, um, those types, those are um, high level cases, um, cases that have usually been indicted by a grand jury um, from the district court. Um, we're usually dealing with more serious crimes. So. I was a judge for 20 years, ma'am. And the way it works is the clerks set bail or let people go on their own recognizance out in police stations. If she did set a bail, it was, or at night. Do you agree with that? I, I don't know, personally. I, I know that she has experience setting bail and um, and shared not necessarily the details of the case, but you know some of those challenges um, in, in making those decisions. So you never observed it yourself. That's correct. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any Thank you. other counselors have any questions of the witness? Thank you. At this point, uh, we've exhausted uh, the folks who will speak in support of. Uh, and thank you for your testimony. Are there anyone, is there anyone here who would like to speak in opposition of the nomination? There being no one in opposition, at this point, we will hear from the nominee. Thank you. Council Ayanella. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. First and foremost, I want to extend my thanks to Lieutenant Governor Polito and Governor Baker for this nomination. This is a tremendous honor, and I thank you both for giving me a seat at this table. I also want to thank you, the governor's counselors, for taking time out of your busy schedules to speak with me about my qualifications and background. I appreciate the seriousness with which you all approach this very important function. I submitted my application for a judgeship because our judiciary does not adequately reflect the communities it serves, and I think it should. Our courts, the district courts in particular, can only benefit from having judges with diverse backgrounds. I have been personally impacted by the judiciary at various stages in my life, and that experience would add value as well. Having had the ability to experience the court from the vantage point of a magistrate, assistant clerk, litigant, and observer provides me with the unique insights that will enable me to serve the district court well if appointed. I didn't have any lawyers in my family. We had no judges or politicians or anyone working in a profession that I could have shadowed. My father worked for the T, driving buses, and my mother was a phlebotomist working at clinics throughout the Boston area. Thanks to my love for Claire Huxtable of The Cosby Show, at the age of five, I was settled on becoming a lawyer. When I got to law school, however, I had no idea what kind of lawyer I would be. The examples I'd seen up to that point had been on TV or in court when I had to accompany my mother for hearings on a few occasions as she tried to use the courts for assistance with one of my sisters who suffers from mental health issues. When I was 13, that sister I just spoke of started to exhibit mental health issues and she got pregnant. She was 16 going on 17 and I, along with my mother and eldest maternal sister, had to step in to raise my nephew. When my eldest maternal sister went off to college, it was just my mother, me, and my nephew. My nephew and I shared a bedroom. I vividly recall making his bottles, changing his diapers, and having to know when he needed to have a time out and then making that call. By the time I reached my junior year of high school and after many, many incidents involving the police, the courts, and various state agencies, 
My sister had had two more children. By the time I got my license to drive, I was acting like a parent. I had the responsibility of picking the kids up from daycare on occasion and running errands when my mother was unable to. I remember attending school events designed for parents on behalf of my mother when she could not. I was the one monitoring their TV intake, ensuring their programming was enriching and appropriate. When I started college, the impact of my sister's mental health issues worsened, culminating with all three of her children being removed from her care. Through court orders and agreements and lots of back and forth, the oldest two were being raised by my eldest maternal sister, and her youngest was being raised by his father. By the time I started law school, my sister had a fourth child, and ultimately she would lose her parental rights to all four of them. The youngest two were ordered to be raised by their fathers, the oldest two remained with my eldest maternal sister. My sister, as one would expect, spiraled after that. Substance use, no treatment for mental health, and nothing to keep her grounded. As I was concluding law school, my sister was charged with a serious crime. She was ordered committed to a state hospital, and that's where she remained from my final year in law school in 2006, through my time at both the Suffolk County DA's office and the Department of Correction at 2011. In that same time period, I would try just under 30 bench and jury trials for firearm offenses, restraining order violations, threats, OUI, and assault and batteries, to name a few. Two years ago, a sua sponte order added one more child to my family. My husband and I took on the responsibility of raising my sister's fifth child. Thankfully, I've had over two decades of training. Over the last two years, my husband, my two little girls, and I have dealt with numerous DCF workers in meetings, advances and setbacks, court dates. We revamped our entire house and household for our nephew. At the same time, I served as a magistrate in Suffolk County, I managed the busiest homicide session in the Commonwealth, and I was the clerk for at least a dozen homicide trials in the Superior Court. I went this far back in my history, and I got this personal because there have been questions about my age and whether I have enough life experience to be a judge. These events have taught me so many of the values that brought me to this table. They required me to mature and develop a greater sense of purpose at an early age, and I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that each of these events was precipitated by judges most of whom I'd never seen, but each of whom had the courage to make tough calls that would change so many lives, mine included. A judge's decision caused me to learn patience starting at 13, when I became an assistant parent to my mother who, by court order, was raising her first grandson. I learned about integrity too, as I watched my mother offer brutally honest accounts of my sister's struggles, knowing that doing so would have so many consequences. Over the years, Judges have made various orders based on those brutally honest accounts, and at one time or another, those orders would impact me in some way. They impacted all of us. I learned perseverance from my eldest maternal sister as I watched her juggle our niece and nephew, DCF, her own son, nursing school, and her boys. A judge awarded her guardianship of my oldest niece and nephew, and I'm so grateful to that judge for not succumbing to any biases. That sister was just 27 and a single mother at the time of the guardianship order. I learned objectivity when a judge awarded custody of two of my sister's children to their fathers rather than to our family. None of us particularly liked those decisions, but we all knew they made sense. Their fathers mattered in all of this too, and they had every right to raise their children. I learned compassion. These experiences taught me a lot about people, our courts, mental health, and how a judicial determination can have rippling effects and change lives. My story is a firsthand account of how judges can alter the course of a person's life for good. You already know that as a magistrate, I've had to make tough decisions. Whether to find probable cause for initial probation violations, whether to hold someone on bail or to release them on their own recognizance, and whether to credit what I'm being told by the parties. I bring that experience as well as everything I just told you with me. I'd be mindful of all of the collateral consequences that may come to bear as a result of my decisions yet make tough decisions when required. My life experience has made me fair, able to focus in the most difficult times, and determined to do good. These are among the most important qualities every judge should have, and I would be honored to serve the people of this commonwealth. I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. We'll hear from uh, Councillor Terrence Kennedy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I apologize for not being in person. I came in here this morning to hopefully do a 10-minute Zoom in Taunton Court, uh, and I still haven't got called there. 
I have to actually go back on there and then I plan on coming back to you. Um, I hope when you are a judge that you're mindful of that with different lawyers that have to be places. Uh, they're not, uh, uh, I let them know what my issue was and they didn't call the case, but that's neither here nor there. Um, just a couple of quick points. We met the other day, uh, spent some time together, um, and I already know you. We've had at least one or two cases together over the years, and uh, I've certainly seen you in Suffolk Superior Court a number of times. Uh, I, did, I just want to address the issue of your age. Uh, I We discussed that the other day. Um, you're certainly a little younger than, as I said, than I would typically like a nominee to be. Uh, I do think you have a great deal of life experience that helps compensate for that a lot. And I also think that it's important that we have some diversity candidates. One of the problems that I raised with you is uh, in terms of getting people in the 45 to 60 year range of people of color as nominees is it goes back to discrimination back 20, 30, 40 years ago when uh, people of color weren't admitted in large numbers in law school. So we have a smaller pool to choose from uh, in that age group. And I think it's important that we have diversity on the bench. And I think that uh, we have to uh, accommodate for that by picking some folks that are a little younger. And I, I think given that, uh, you're a perfect pick because of your life experience, even though you're a little younger. Um, second, I, I know that Council Hurley had some issues about uh, when you set bail and don't set bail. Uh, I don't think she was aware that clerk magistrates in the courthouse in Suffolk Superior Court and Middlesex as well actually set bail for defendants in court and have bail hearings there, uh, which I've seen you do uh, on a number of occasions. I don't know if I've had a bail argument in front of you, but I've certainly seen you do them. Uh, and uh, you, you do a great job at, uh, at uh, figuring out what's an appropriate bail for people. Uh, you're a home run as far as I'm concerned, and uh, I'm absolutely going to be voting for you next week. Uh, no question about it. I'm going to come off. I have to get back in the Taunton court on Zoom, but I'll be back. Um, and Bob, that wasn't a threat. Hey. See you later. Thank you. Councilor Juvenal, any questions? Just a few. Uh, and nice to see you this morning. Likewise. Good morning, Councilor Juvenal. Tell me, uh, tell me why we have bail. What's the purpose of bail? The purpose of bail is to ensure that a person will return if they're released on their own recognizance. Um, just making sure that they can come back to court um, when ordered to do so. Do you think most people, most people come back to court when they're required to? I think a vast majority of people do come back to court when they are required to, yes. I, I would agree that only a very small percentage seem to default and usually the defaults are I'll call technical defaults with a lot of people that they can't get into a court or they can't make it to a court on a certain day or they have issues with alcohol or drugs and uh, that's preventing them from coming in the court that day but I haven't seen very much of when things when I first started practicing where people would actually default and take off you know leave the jurisdiction or go somewhere I, I know it probably still happens to some degree, but I, I don't see it as much as it used to be. Um, and uh, a lot of people I've always said, you know, sit in these jails because they can't come up with a hundred or two hundred dollars, and that separates them from coming out of a court, uh, a jail, getting back on the street where if they had the money, they'd be out. So I'm glad that there were some decisions on bail, and it's changed as far as holding people in these nominal amounts of money just because they're poor and they can't raise it. Uh, there, is a group, there is a group that is uh, out putting up money for people to get out of uh, out of jail on bails. What do you think of that? I think if the bail is set and there's an ability to pay that bail, then so be it. It should be paid. Yeah. I, I agree. I don't particularly care who pays it. If somebody puts up money and they run the risk of losing their money if the person doesn't come back to court. But that, that doesn't happen very much either. I haven't heard of one of those in a long time. Uh, um, I don't really have a lot of questions for you. Um, Mike Coyne called me at length about you and uh, my friend Mike Coyne and my friend Judge uh, Locke uh, sent a wonderful uh, writing on your behalf spoke tremendous of you and they, they mean a lot to me those two people so 
if they're about oh, for that I, I didn't ask them to so i appreciate that <laughs> i didn't i did not well they did it and they did it well so you must have made an impression on them and that means a lot to me so thank you i appreciate that that's all the questions i have mr chair thank you uh councillor ferrara do you have any uh, excuse me councillor hurley thank you um good morning uh we talked at some length uh, over the phone, uh, and I just have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, what have you done since we talked about uh, getting familiar with 209A complaints versus the uh, uh, harassment complaints? Uh, I studied the 209A statute, particularly Section 1, defining abuse, um, to make sure I have it down pat and, and um, able to determine which of the three ways a person may be able to argue for a restraining order in their favor. I also went back over my old spreadsheets from my time back in the BMC Central, looking over cases that I had tried, including uh, violations of restraining orders. And as I wrote my personal statement, I thought about all the instances that I had experienced personally that also involved restraining orders with various me members of my family seeking them or being the subject of them. Um, so I had to think about all of those things, and I think I have a pretty decent handle on it. Obviously, I can always learn more. Um, but I think I have a decent handle on the, the standard required. Uh, spend a day with the judge who's the head of the uh, domestic abuse uh, subcommittee in the district court, and you'll get a whole manual. But um, having experienced it yourself uh, as a judge, you have to make decisions at 2 o'clock in the morning you have judicial response that will have an impact on people's lives. Um, and I guess the most important thing is even when someone says they're not really in fear, if the facts and circumstances surrounding it um, and the history of domestic violence um, indicate it, you might think twice about not issuing an order. There have been instances where family members have said they're not in fear of and the next thing you know, uh, the judge has released the people or the, the defendant and uh, he went home and killed the mother, the stepfather and himself. So it, it can have a really heavy burden um, on you in those situations. <coughs> One other question as it relates to the issue of bail and mental illness. Um, you have somebody the court were charged with uh, the assault and battery on a parent. And there's also a clear history of mental illness. That person is examined by the um, psychiatrist who in some instances works in the court system or is brought in as someone to render an opinion. That just says that person, the defendant, is in fact mentally ill. However, there's no bed. But that defendant does, in fact, exhibit significant symptoms that would put the victim at substantial risk of further harm. The district attorney says, judge, we're asking for bail at least until a bed can be found. Defense attorney argues against it. What would you do? Given all the factors that you've outlined, I think I've been in this situation as a magistrate, I would order the person held on bail pending a bed because I recognize how um, dangerous it can be. Um, if someone is released and they're in active cycle with their mental health issues, bad things can absolutely happen. Um, I would hope to listen to the parent if the parent was available to get a sense of what they believe um, might be helpful. Um, but I think my determination, my initial reaction may be um, to hold that person pending the availability of a bed and perhaps have it come in day to day until a bed is found. Thank you very much. Um, we had a long conversation. And um, I think that 
in spite of your age, or perhaps because of your age, but your life experiences, um, you're going to add a significant dimension to the district court, which I sat in for 20 years. Uh, and I think that you will make sound reason judgments. Um, and I guess at some point in time with all of us, if you get where you're going to lose it because of what people have done to each other in terms of, especially with abuse complaints, take a risk if you are overwhelmed by the facts of, and circumstances of a case that involves and sentencing, take a recess. Just give. And my last bit of advice to you is to sit on the bench. I actually had one judge come into the court and she didn't have, well, fortunately I had two because my parents had given me one and I had one from the Bar Association. So good luck to you. I think you're gonna do a great job and I'm 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 glad that you are someone who recognizes the significant contributions they can make as a person of color. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I appreciate you with the Council Early. Early. Uh, next we'll hear from Councillor Marilyn Petito Devaney. Um, nice to see you again, Michael. Thank you for all the well. time you afforded me. That was over four hours that we met, and um, it was really a pleasure. Um, first of all, I always ask the nominee the process of how you arrived here. Um, so, you know, how many times have you applied and, and all of that? Um, now, you applied, it was the first time you've applied. That's all. And um, I. Um, I think I'm correct that you have to have 10 years um, being an attorney to apply for judgeship. That's right. And uh, according to your uh, resume, it's 13 years. And uh, when you applied, you were 38 years old. You had a birthday this past Last week. Last Friday. Happy birthday. Thank you. But um, so tell me, when you applied and when the Judicial Nominating Commission interviewed you? So the application was in early November, I think the second week or so of November, I submitted then. I had my JNC interview in January, late January of this year. Months? About. Wow, you were lucky. Okay, I, um, I do want to say that, um, you know, I, I've been asking for diversity and I'm very pleased in that. But besides diversity, I want that person to be experienced and, um, and, uh, and have the qualifications that I look for. So, um, you know, we talked about this. I said, when we met, I said, you're an acting clerk magistrate. And, um, and, and in my experience, people come before me and they're looking to be a clerk magistrate. Now, why did you not apply for a clerk magistrate? Being a clerk magistrate as, as being consistent with what I see myself being able to bring to the judiciary. It's an important function, um, don't get me wrong, um, but I, can, I see myself being a judge, being able to make those tough calls and bring all of my experience, both professional and personal, to the table. Well, um, and I did mention this to you, that your um, resume is very different than what I usually see. Three years, three years, three years, four months, 10 months, three years, um, four years. Uh, I don't usually see that. It usually has um, quite a bit of years mm -hmm. in, in, in one particular place doing those particular duties. Um, I asked you when you decided you wanted to be a judge, and you said right from the beginning that you came out. So I'm wondering if all of these different um, positions that you went to from different jobs, tell me about that. Um, every career move was very intentional and designed um, with the goal of being able to sit right here at this table. I was always hopeful that I may be a, nominated to be a judge, but I never really thought it was possible because I hadn't seen very many judges who looked like me in the courtroom, in the various courtrooms that I've been in. Um, so every career move was designed to make me more well-rounded, more well-versed in a variety of areas of the law so, so that if this opportunity did present itself to me, I'd be able to hit the ground running. So that was the reason for all of the career moves. 
Um, how many trials have you had? I've had just under 30 jury and bench trials combined. And they were jury trials or bench trials? Jury and bench combined. I've had significantly more jury trials than bench trials. Though. Okay. How, how many cases? Oh, my caseloads? I've had hundreds of cases. I mean, the BMC Central, my caseload is probably upwards of 100 to 150. As you progress, your caseload gets a little bit smaller. Um, and also, when I was in landlord tenant law practice, my caseload was, was, was very high as well. Uh, this probably doesn't apply, but I'm going to ask it. You work for the uh, Massachusetts Department of Health. Uh, did you have any involvement in that um, uh, in that travesty that happened with the um, with the chemist? Uh, no, I did not. Um, all of those things transpired after I left the DA's office and well before I got to the Department of Public Health. So, um, all right. So you have worked in you know in district office for three years. You worked ten months in the Department of Correction, four months or in, in a, a private firm. All of these. Um, what would you choose out of all of these positions that you've held? Um, that it makes you more qualified to be a judge. I think all of these jobs combined um, make me a great candidate to be a judge. They've given me the opportunity to travel across the Commonwealth and sit in various sessions before many different judges dealing with all different kinds of matters, whether they were criminal, civil, landlord, tenant, or administrative. Um, they've given me a peek into sort of what it's like to have a judge make a, a tough decision and those and then collateral consequences that may come from those decisions. So I'm thinking specifically of my time at the Department of Public Health, where I had a role as a prosecutor to protect the people of this commonwealth and take people out of practice if they were violating the regulations that govern their practice. Um, and that was very fulfilling work. Um, I, I had an opportunity to not only prosecute, but also help someone. We had a lot of nurses who were um, addicted to opioids, who were stealing uh, medications from patients. And rather than take them out of practice entirely and ruin their livelihood, I had the power at GPH to have them hold on to their license, but undergo treatment. Um, so I, I, I think I've had a good enough background that gives me a, a good insight into people and how people work. Um, I want to correct myself. I, I said you're acting. You were assistant clerk magistrate. Right. But um, I guess that, you know, from looking at thousands over the 21 years, that uh, I, I just are trying to figure out why you would apply for uh, assistant clerk magistrate uh, when, you know, if you wanted to have more experience as a judge, you want to, um, you know, be able to. Um, represent people and, and um, you know what I mean, and, and be able to bring that to to the council. So it, it seems like, you know, going from the Department of Public Health, I'm not demeaning that at all. It's a, that's a wonderful thing that you did. But, um, you know, it just seems like, um, um, I don't know, go, it, it, not going backwards, and I don't want me to say it demeaningly like that, but how did, how did that come up, that this, uh, this position, assistant clerk magistrate? I've been applying to be an assistant clerk magistrate um, in various courts for years because I thought it was important that if this was going to be an ultimate goal, this being becoming a judge, I'd need to get a peek inside the court from the other side of the courtroom. Up until this time as an assistant clerk magistrate of and Superior, my vantage point had always been on the opposite side of the courtroom. So to be able to look at the people face on, I think was compelling and I think it was something that was necessary for me. Um, well, one, everybody knows the one thing I look for experience and qualifications is empathy. Uh, I, I think a lot of judges don't have empathy. And um, I see that with you in your life experience, and I really appreciate that. Um, so out of all of these positions, what one position would you would you say that made, uh, that would prepare you most to be a judge? It's a tough question because like I say, every single career move was designed um, to get me to this ultimate goal. Um, and I could I could pick something from every single job um, that made a difference that helped to get me here. Um, I think the DA's office was instructive just because I was in court every day. At that point I had the opportunity to sort of be brought up by various judges, Judge Michael Coyne being one of them. 
and being able to have conversations with them after my trials to learn what went right, what didn't go so great, um, and being able to help people um, was really instrumental, I think, in propelling me and really helping me to see what my purpose probably was, um, which is to help people and be able to serve other people. Did, did you work under Dean Connolly? I did. They call me hard. Very lucky. Good man. Um, so, um, okay, so, uh, uh, you, know, I, you know, I learned a lot about you. And that's why I like to meet with everyone. And I have in 21 years met everyone from parole board to judge because I'm voting for the whole person, not just this person on the paper. And I learned about you in the person. And uh, I mean, we should be very proud. And you know, we should be very grateful and very proud, too. So, um, no, I, it was, you know, do you, um, do you think, the, what do you think the, the most learning curve going into uh, a judgeship with your experience, what do you think it's going to be the hardest thing to learn to pursue a That's also a tough question to answer. I think that it's important to acknowledge the time that we are in and how COVID has required the courts to drastically change everything. Um, so I think that would be something to, to pick up. Um, and learn. I mean, I've also had experience you know, managing the Zooms for the courthouse that I was working in at Southern Superior. Um, so I'm familiar with the technology, but I think, yes, that would be a bit of a learning curve, not having those one on one interactions with the judges who might need to. Excuse me, one second. Excuse me. Michelle, could you get a little closer to the mic, please? Thank you. Um, in your experience, what changes would you like to see in the district court? That's tough for me to answer also because I haven't been in the district court in quite some time. I know that the budget is a significant concern and with a limited budget, the courts have limited resources, which means judges are limited in what they can ultimately offer to the people in terms of a resolution. So to the extent that there's any way to make changes in that regard, that would be the major one. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you for all the time and, and coming the distance. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Councilor. Thank Dibbing. you. Good morning, Councilor Ferrara. I don't know if you can see um, Councilor Ferrara and uh, Chris. I don't Excuse know if you can hear it. I didn't hear. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I know he's there. Uh, he was my next witness, uh, my next person to speak, actually. Councilor Joseph Ferrara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, had the pleasure of listening on the way up in the car. Uh, so... Um, I just want to thank you for the hours that we spent together recently um, at first. And I told you, I thought um, you were, you know, your resume might have been a little light um, and you were very young. And then I told you that as a police chief uh, for more than nine years, I never, um, I never promoted the ones that hung around the, the longest. I promoted the ones that did the best. And your life experience is just phenomenal. And once I get to see you and um, hear your story and the dearth of experience you've had, so many areas of um, of your life it's just incredible so um i'm not going to um grandstand and ask you a bunch of questions that we've went over for hours already i think you're going to be a great judge thank you. um i thank you for your service as an assistant district attorney as well as when you worked for the department of public health and other other public service jobs that you held you held a lot of them too many to name um and i think that um, you're going to bring all that compassion with your, all your family experiences um compassion and i think you have a great temperament I know Judge Locke reached out to me yesterday and some other judges have reached out to me as well saying that, uh, how smart and uh, what a great person you are and you're going to bring all that to the bench. So you have my support next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the judges. Thank you very much. We are going to just take a two-minute recess, not five, just a two-minute recess so everyone can sit tight and we'll resume in two minutes. Uh, so just sit tight. Thank you. Eileen, you're going to be next, but in one minute. We're taking a one-minute recess.
Okay, is uh, when, once uh, the nominee is uh, is on, we'll be able to resume and uh, we'll just wait for the nominee. Okay, uh, Councillor Duff, do you have any questions of the nominee? Well, first of all, it's great to see her in person. We spend a lot of time talking on the telephone. Um, I, I just have a couple of questions. And, um, but first of all, I want to say, I, uh, Attorney Fentress, thank you so much for applying. Um, um, I, I, I found your I recipe, found your recipe. So, just so refreshing, so enlightening, and you know, uh, maybe not what we always see, but honestly, you're bringing to the bench the life experience that I think we absolutely uh, need, and I think people are craving right now. So uh, thank you for that. My. Um, <coughs> One of my biggest concerns is, uh, and I'm sure people have talked about it, is being so young, uh, this is a job that can take an emotional, uh, mental, and spiritual toll on somebody. And I wanted to ask you if you've um, thought about that and, and how it could affect you and how it could affect your family and, um, you know, do you plan to deal with that? Um, first of all, good morning. I'm not sure if you heard my personal statement, but I, I took uh, great pains to go through all of the sort of emotional things that I've experienced yep. throughout my life that have prepared me for this moment. I know. So in a sense, I've, I've not to boast, but I, in a sense, I've sort of been built for this. Um, mm -hmm. On top of that, I think that the variety of cases would be enough to not necessarily cause me to be burnt out. And also, I want to remind everyone that I've got three kids at home that I'm raising, an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a five-and-a-half-year-old. And I am sure the next decades of their lives will uh, keep me busy and give me other things to focus on as well. All right, great. Um, so when we spoke uh, briefly, um, well, we spoke actually for a really long time on uh, several occasions. But there were there were a couple of issues that are, are concerning to me. And I, and I apologize because I did have to jump on late. Um, and you may have already addressed this. But one of the uh, groups of people that I am concerned with in the courts are people who are differently abled, um, not just physically differently abled, but uh, maybe with some different uh, mental capacities. And I wanted to ask you, you know, I worry about people with um, Asperger's or or somewhere on the spectrum, and and what can not just the dangers for them in society, but under stress, people don't always react. I know I don't sometimes, or especially when I was younger. Um, how one may expect, and so do you have any experience dealing with folks like that? Because I think they need to be. Um, treated, uh, I think we need to be aware of that, especially when they're in the courtroom. I am keenly aware of that. Um, and again, it, it goes back to my personal familial history. Not that I have anyone in my family with Asperger's, um, but at least one of the nieces that I spoke of um, does have some cognitive issues that aren't apparent when you see her. And she doesn't always react the way that I, I would under stress, but because I'm aware of that and how it presents in her, it's something I look out for, something that I would look out for. So I'm, I'm aware of it, I'm keenly aware of it, um, and, I, and I don't see myself having any issues um, being able to identify things like this. Well, good, because that's something that, um, you know, I tell people I had close to a Down syndrome, and if Terry walked into a room, you knew she had a, a cognitive disability. But when you see some of these other folks, you don't know. And in the, you know, but the stress and the circumstances and the behavior may not be what we consider appropriate. And, you know, we're all working hard to become more aware today, but um, there's always a danger of somebody, um, especially if they end up incarcerated or being held for any period of time, of being in, in real danger uh, because of those disabilities. So it, it's nice to hear that. Um, I know we, we've spoken long about addiction. Um, the last issue I wanted to ask you about any experience or thoughts on is uh, the LGBTQ uh, community where right now we have a lot of uh, young gay, lesbian, transsexual, bisexual kids 
who and, and maybe some older but usually younger um who don't feel safe at home they don't feel safe in foster homes and many of them are on the streets um and they're working in the sex trades which is extraordinarily dangerous and we have young lesbians becoming pregnant and we have young uh all folks becoming uh you know infected with hiv and it's a tra it's tragic and i also know um that the transgender issue is extraordinarily difficult for many people to grasp and understand and i i get that but it's a real thing I, the whole it's all real it might not be part of our in everyday lives but this is real stuff and I strongly feel as adults, as elected officials, as attorneys, potential judges, that we have a moral responsibility, not just ethical, but a moral responsibility to make sure that these young people are safe. Whether we understand the challenges or issues or whatever one wants to call them or not. Um, can, do you have any experience working with that community or, or thoughts on that? I agree with everything you've said. Um, I don't have any uh, experience working with these communities, um, but what I can tell you is that I bring awareness of those issues to the bench and okay. rule accordingly. All right, great, thank you. Because I know particularly with some of the transgender um, folks that even, you know, where they're, if they're going to be, and, and you know, let me be clear, having, um, just because you're a member of a community, whether it be a cognitive disability or LGBTQIA, whatever, uh, doesn't mean if you've committed a crime that you're absolved from the crime or given a special dispensation. Um, our job is to in, in, enforce the law accordingly, but at the same time, making sure people are safe. And so with, with some of these communities, it may be, you know, what group, how do they identify um, man or woman, and then where, if they're going to be incarcerated, where do you incarcerate them? What type of clothing, um, you, you pronouns, that sort of thing. So um, it is, it's, it's very important. And I thank you for for being aware of it. And I have every, um, I, I'm with every fiber of my body. I know that you will uh, respect people, all people, in the courtroom. So. This is a great appointment. I'm, I can't be more pleased. I, I found your application to be uh, very, very thoughtful, and I deeply appreciate it. So no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have uh, any questions. We had a, a lengthy conversation over the weekend. Um, I think you're going to be an outstanding uh, jurist in the district court. It was great to see uh, your two witnesses. Um, I'm unfamiliar with um, Attorney Boston, but I, as I indicated to you, I've known uh, Judge Coyne for a long, long time, uh, and I have the highest uh, regard for Judge Coyne. I uh, just want you to know that next week I'd be more than happy and proud to put your name uh, before the council. I wish you the best, your family. It's a big day, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, that will conclude the hearing. Uh, and I thank everyone for being so patient. Thank you. Great job, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much.